Let me say um, welcome to Make Space Series 2, How to Design Electronics. Um, I think this is episode four, this one here. And the, the aim of these little set of those who haven't joined us before, um, it's really about, I've been doing this for 27 years as an electronics engineer in and around Cambridge. And it's about sharing some ideas and basically some of my experience on different subjects. And of course, you know, a lot of you will have experience and, and opinions on things. Uh, it is live, as I always say, so anything can go wrong. Um, it hasn't happened for a long time, but sometimes the video goes flaky. So by all means, if the video goes really flaky, um, then shout and we'll spend ages trying to fix it. As I say, uh, my name is Stephen Clement. Um, I'm an electronics engineer. Um, the slides, so I've got an overhead camera here and I've got some printed out slides which uh, I'll share with you. And they are all available to download. I'll show you the link how to get to them in just a second. So you don't need to write anything down. This is just a kick back and, and enjoy hour. Um, yeah, whilst I remember, I've been asked by a few people at Makespace to think about doing this live from Makespace itself. So the plan is in from January, um, which I think it's January the second or something, first Wednesday of the month. Um, it will be streamed as well for those who may be in Bosnia. Um, but from January, you can also turn up to the classroom uh, with a plate biscuits and a cup of tea. And uh, we can all do this hopefully face to face. If COVID kicks off again, we may have to rethink that plan. But hopefully we won't have to. Turn that down. I've got a little time here that helps me keep on track with everything. Right. OK, so I'm going to swap to an overhead camera. And if it looks like I've frozen or gone quiet, then somebody will have to pipe up. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just wrap it on and be completely oblivious, um, apart from me and the cats here. So I'm going to try here and swap to an app. I really hope this works. Right. OK, so fingers crossed. You can all see that. Does that work for anybody? Yeah, looking good. Fantastic. Right. OK, anyway, that's just the opening slide. So get rid of that straight away. Right, as I just mentioned, these are everything here is available to download. So if you do want them, they're already up there, download already. If you want to do that, just pop over to the website Silicon Cortex UK, scroll down until you see downloads, hit downloads, and then you will see HTDE, How to Design Electronics, uh, season two. That's what we're on right now. And in there, what we're going to look at and talk about, um, you'll find it all in there, ready to rock and roll. So without further ado, so this particular little session is all about serial communications using things like the Arduino, um, uh, which is Atmel, or microchip now, of course, AVR chip, uh, embed as well, the, the ARM stuff, um, even the Raspberry Pi, it, it's this, what we're going to look at is applicable to all those platforms. And so we're going to concentrate and have a little look at a couple of them here. Well, three, actually. First two here at the top, um, you'll often see it called I squared C, little two here, or IIC. They do a little square because it's II for inter integrated. So, you know, someone got all clever and put I2C. This is generally the logo you'll see associated with it. Um, so we're going to look at that first. It's a communication protocol on chips we'll talk about. And th then we'll move over to another one. Um, so this one was invented by Philips in, in the mid 80s. And then Motorola got involved and they came up with the serial peripheral interface, which is a little bit different for sure. And then what I wanted to share with you is something which I worked on for a couple of years, and uh, this is my take on, on I2C and SPI, which is called the Enhanced Serial Bus. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of what I've put together, um, which turns out to be really quite useful. And 
solve some of the problems which we're about to experience with I2C and SPI when it comes to implementing them. So, uh, right, so let's have a little look to start with at the good old favourites um, Arduino board. So on those boards, and of course, this entire series two, although we've got different topics, we're going to focus on how they apply to microcontrollers or even a microprocessor. So taking our AVR, <clears throat> if you ever have a look at one, you'll see that usually in the top here, you get one I2C port, which we'll have a look at in just a moment, and you get one SPI port, which we'll look at afterwards. If you've got an older Arduino board, <clears throat> you'll find that these two pins, the I2C, are actually over here on the analog port. And I think it might be um, A4 and A5, but it might be wrong, it might be the other end. So they're always on the board. In the later models, they decided to bring it out up here, so it looked like it was on, on the digital port. So I can see the sense in that. So with the Arduino that we will know and love, the Uno in particular, you're going to get one of each port. And we'll have a look at how we use them in just a moment. If you move over to using ARM chips, you generally find, uh, even on the most basic chips, and this one here is probably uh, the M0 um, Nucleo board, uh, I think the 072, memory serves me correctly, you generally find on those you'll get several uh, I2C pin ports and SPI. Um, so you hear they've got, they've got a couple on here and you generally find that some of these other pins which are sort of grayed out here, you, you'll find other I2C ports and SPI ports. So which one do you go for? I don't really think it matters that much. Um, whatever you can, whatever you can buy, I suppose, and whatever you're comfortable with. <clears throat> in terms of, we'll have a look at plugging things in. Um, I2C and SPI are on, I would probably say, nearly 100%, 9900 100% of chip sensors and memory chips. So you'll always pretty much find one of these two protocols, probably even both on a lot of chips, um, ready to use. And it's an industry standard and they're pretty straightforward to use. There's nothing to worry about. Okay, right. And just share with you if you can all still see that. So uh, I don't have any shares in any of these things I, which I show you. Um, what I would just say is with the I2C, this is not a bad book. Um, you could probably get it off Amazon. I think it's about £30. And for you know, getting a little more deeper into understanding and some of the things you can do with I2C, um, this is, is not a bad little book to, to treat yourself to. So. That's my first real pearl of wisdom. Um, you mentioned them being present on most sensors and memory chips, but there's mm -hmm. some temperature sensors I noticed with one wire bus. Is that a variant of one of these? No. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So one wire is a, it's a different protocol where what they do is that the clock and the data and sometimes even powering the chip is all done over the same interface. So no, you won't, you'll have to, if you're gonna use one wire, you're gonna to have to probably write um, the driver and how you control it yourself. Typical, um, well, I wasn't aware of temperature chips with that. Ones I typically see with one wire are usually um, serial number chips. So if you want to put a serial number on a product, like, like if you've got like uh, these in the AVR, for example, um, and it's usually just like a small SOT23, like a small transistor sort of size chip, and they're usually one wire serial numbers. I, I hadn't seen the 
temperature one way at all but um, there's a fairly common temperature module quite low uh -huh. um that you'll find the raspberry pi type suppliers will sell oh there you go that's right. a, a maxim chip right okay and that's a one um, wire there's arduino libraries for it so oh, oh, oh fantastic yeah. okay right i stand it's pretty correct. simple it's... to get up and running on esp chips which is what i've used it on or on the arduino right yeah okay right yeah so it's, it's, it's not it's not exclusive but uh you know i i found that say i2c and spi they they're, they're pretty prolific they've been around since the 1980s so they're, they're, they're pretty they're pretty solid okay good one good one i'm all for the interruptions please keep them coming so um so let's let's turn our attention shall we to the the first one here the i2c oh hang on a minute my battery's running away stay there um there we go Right. It was plugged in, but the computer wasn't, the power switch wasn't on. <laughs> right, I've still got you all, I hope. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, the computer suddenly said low power, so it was plugged in, but I hadn't turned the wall socket on. Uh, that was a momentary panic there. Right, okay, so I2C um, is a little whirlwind tour. So this is an example of the sort of thing you might, you might actually get. Um, this is just this is actually a temperature chip. Um, I think it may even be Maxim. Um, just have a world tour. It's two wires. One, one, one's called always called SDA, which means data and address. And this is bi-directional, so data and it can go the address can go in both directions. And you have a SCL, which stands for serial clock. And that's obviously going to be going to whatever your device may be. You also have to, with I2C, remember that you need some pull-up resistance. Um, I've been helping a company recently, and uh, they forgot to put their pull-up resistors on. Yes, it may still work, but it may also present some problems if you do forget that. And the value which I've got here, this is 4.7 kilo ohms, is around about the sort of value you should be using. If you've got more devices on the bus, um, I found I've had to reduce that, that value in order to drive the bus properly. So don't forget you pull up resistors. With I2C, everything has an address. So if you haven't come across I2C before, um, you can imagine it a little bit like where you live and everybody's got an address. And if you wanted to send someone a birthday card or pick something up, you'd have to go to the right address. So the address itself, um, some of it is predefined. It's seven bits. In fact, I'll draw on here. Usually you'll find that we'll do seven or eight, A7, A6, A5, you'll see that, A4, a3, A2, A1, A0. So what you'll find with a lot of chips is that this first section will be fixed and written in stone for the chip. And the last three you can actually, or maybe one, or it may be two, depending on the manufacturer and the chip, are what you can do, decide what you want them to be. So this is a temperature chip. So you could easily have multiple temperature chips all stuck together. That wouldn't be a problem. I always, another top tip, when in my schematics, I always write down what the, what the actual dress is of the device. Um, you can't really get into the coding in, in this session. I thought about that, it would just take a little bit too long to get, to get into the coding side. Um, but yeah, so that's really the, the start of it all. Most of them are 3.3 volt chips. Um, you know, a lot of them also run on five volts or maybe even down to 1.2 volts. But 3.3 is pretty much a de facto standard and, and pretty easy to get hold of. So 
Um, just a few more little top tips here for you. Um, a lot of these chips, open drain, that's what I should share with you. So we'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about the enhanced serial bus. Most of these sensors also have what's called uh, like an interrupt or some other function on the chip, which you'd wire this back to a GPIO pin on your you know, digital data bus, whether it's uh, Arduino or anything else. That we'll come back to this because the more devices you've got, the more of these extra pins you have, and you've only got a fixed number of them. So we'll come back to how we deal with that problem um, in a couple of uh, moments' time. Can I check what you said about the address? Because you're saying seven bit one two seven addresses, but you wrote down eight bits. Did I? Well spotted. <laughs> also, you've got the top bit set zero. Forgive me. X nine zero. Yeah, yeah, well spotted. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, usually, um, in fact, okay, let me touch upon that in a little bit more detail for you. That's a very good point. Let me share with you a little bit more on that. So usually what you'll find is, if I do it here for you, all right, I'll try and do this right. Um, trying to draw this right, if you can all see this okay, I think you can. Right, yeah, so you have one here, it's called the read write bit, and then A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Yeah, forgive me for doing um, an extra bit in there. So, yeah, so usually um, depends on the chip, but not all, not all chips will have this. A lot of chips will give you the option for setting some of the address bits. Of, of the chip so you because if you get a different chip you know you might have you know if you can have 127 um options there not you'd ever have that many but if you did there's a very high probability that a lot of these chips will end up share trying to share the same address and that would be a very bad thing to want to do so very often they'll give you the ability to actually configure the some of the bits usually the lower one to three bits, it's usually what I tend to see. And the other ones are, are usually are fixed. You can't, you, um, by, by the vendor, you won't be able to change those. And, it's, it's, and depending whether you want to write to it, like sending something or receive something, um, there's a read write bit, which is also usually part of the address as well. Uh, as I say, um, this, this really cool book, uh, this one here. Um, so. It, I do recommend, I found it really useful, um, goes into a lot more detail um, uh, in, into how, how a lot more of it works. And also some really good examples in, in here. In fact, some of them, we're, we're gonna have, have a look at one of them in just a moment, one of the examples in here, which um, I do actually use quite a bit. So I think it's really, really good. Okay, yeah, so good, good, good catch. Uh, I, I did sneak an extra, an extra bit on the end. Um, that was just a test to see if you were, were paying attention. Um, just talk about board rates. This is probably one of the maybe downsides of I2C over SPI is um, the board rate, which is how fast you get data out or into it. Like you are, if you've ever played with that, there are fixed um, um, data rates that you can use them at. Um, the default, whenever you switch on, is usually 100K. That, that's usually the standard one which uh, you can use. Um, you can usually invariably just switch it up by setting them in encode to 400. Um, it still work quite well. <clears throat> I know that one meg and 3.4 meg are standards. I'll be perfectly honest, I've never used or seen any I2C using these using these high high data rates. Um, I usually I usually switch to the four hundred. If I'm honest with you, yep. Are these bits per second or bytes per second? Bits per second. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Otherwise, it'd be eight oh, times course, faster. Of course, because it's bored. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No problem at all. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've I've never ever seen. Uh, and, and I've never used these upper ones, but um, if you read around, you'll find they exist. Um, and this is usually the default one that's set. 
And I think you'll probably find for probably 99% of stuff you do, I think the default one will be absolutely fine in your actual default temperature. They don't change that fast. Okay, so uh, let me just show you before we move on to SPI. Um, so if you want to put multiple devices together, this is just an example of how you might do it. So this is the uh, the at Mega, that's on our on our Uno. And obviously I've still got my pull-up resistors, and it's just a common bus to as many devices as I might choose to have. And sure enough, what I might want to do, you might be starting to about, and I might want to think about maybe connecting. Uh, that output to a GPIO, yep. And I might want to connect that interrupt. Um, so, so you can see that there's a lot of extra pins on these chips, which you might want to think about wiring up. You don't necessarily have to, um, but if you did, you might have to just think about that in your design. Right, okay, let's switch it up to SPI, shall we? Have a look at SPI. So um, <clears throat> this is the Motorola's answer, I think. So ITC was two wires, SDA and SCL. SPI is four wires. Um, it's one's called, we've got S clock, which is the clock line. And then we have called MOSI and MISO. This stands for master out, serial in. So master out means if the processor is the master, so it's going out that way and slave into the slave. So we call this the master and that one the slave. So, so you can use the same, the idea is to use the same name to describe what, exactly what's going on in that line. It works pretty well. Master in, yeah, and of course slave out. So with SPI, the lines are dedicated to um, being an input or an output. There's no bi-directional stuff to worry about. We don't have to worry about any pull-ups or pull-downs on these lines either. There is one small difference is on how we address an SPI device. And whereas with the SPI uh, I2C rather, everything was had like a seven bit address, with your SPI devices, <coughs> It's all. It's got a a chip select. You sometimes you'll see SS, um, or you might see it as CS. It's exactly the same thing, and they're always active low. So it's a good idea, as a top tip, to ha have a pull up resistor on the chip select line. And the reason you want to do that is if you put if you had lots of devices connected to the serial bus, and you reset the chip, when you reset your processor, these control lines are usually floating. And if they're floating, you don't necessarily know what this chip is doing. This might suddenly start to try and talk when, when you don't want it to. So you can stop that happening just by putting a pull-up resistor. So that's why there's one there. And 10K, 100K, That'll be just fine, no problems whatsoever. And every single chip that you have on the SPI has its own chip select line. So I've got a circuit in just a sec, which I'll show you. <clears throat> so the more devices you want to have on an SPI, the more dedicated lines you're going to need to control your devices. And that can be a problem, but we're going to fix that with the enhanced serial bus. So there's a few little bits and pieces here just to share with you. Um, so one of the key things here is that any board will do. I think that was a song by, um, what was that? Any song will do. Jason and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, yeah? Anyone remembers that? No, just me. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> with ITC, everything had fixed board rates with SPI. It's pretty much as fast as your, your chip and your, your code can handle it. So you'll often find that memory chips are going to be um, SPI rather than I2C, whereas 
I generally find that most um, sensor chips for sensors seem to be more I2C, is my general observation. And just to finish this off is if we wanted to put several of them together on a bus. So the clock, the MISO and the MOSI are all connected, all common to everything. Um, but each device, this is flash memory here, which I've, which I've wired up. Each flash chip has its own chip select or memory uh, or address, if you want to think of it like that. So you can see that with, with an UNO, there'd be a very limited number of devices you could actually put on an SPI bus before. You know, you've only got, what, eight pins there on port zip C. And, well, you haven't got that many spare, have you, if you wanted to keep your UART free. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So th there we go. So. That covers I2C and SPI, and you can start to see some of the issues with the limitation of the number of pins. Let me um, show what, you. Yep. What voltages are they? Are these always 3.3 or some of them five or what? Uh, so yeah, good question. 3.3, 5.5 uh, volts. So I would probably say what you'd need to do <coughs> is uh, when you select your device is make sure that you do check most devices I've noticed these days tend to be certainly 3.3 volts. Um, some I've come across are lower, like 1.2 volts or 1.8 volts, um, but there's no real need to start using those because you'll find what you want in a, in a 3v3. I would stick with 3v3 if it were me, or 3v3, you know, 3v3 to 5 volts for um, that particular chip. You'll probably find these flash memories. It probably will be something like 3.3 or maybe may even be something like 2.6 volts to something like 5.5 volts. That's not uncommon. Excuse me, there you go. I did that. Let me just rotate the camera slightly. There we go. I'm a lefty, so I tend to rotate things. Oops. If you can still see that okay. And the uh, and what sort of physical length of wire can these typically drive? Oh, are you really looking at things on the same printed circuit board? Or could <coughs> yes, you out to yes. Cabinet? Okay, so funnily enough, uh, we're going to talk about how to take these things off board in in, in just a few moments. Oh, great. But yes, yeah, so I two C and SPI, uh, very very good point, John. So I two C and SPI are board level communications. They are designed for going from one side of a PCB to another side of a PCB. Um, you could go over a short connector if you had like a plug-in door to board. They are not designed for going over long data cables. How you get them over long data cables, um, I've got that for you in five minutes, how you do that. So uh, stay tuned. So let me first, before we get round to, round to that, let's have a look at the enhanced serial um, bus, or ESB, as uh, I have coined the phrase. So the ESB, it's a hybrid of I2C and SPI. So we're not changing any of the protocols for controlling chips. What we are doing is get using the best of both worlds to be able to get as many devices on a bus of ITC or SPI without having to tie up the um, GPIO pins of the um, processor chip. And how do we do that is we use the I2C, um, obviously you know, we can control I2C devices as we have here, but we actually use the I2C bus and we use an IO expander, which I'll show you in just a second, to actually control the chip selects of other chips. So an IO expander, um, in fact, let me just, I've got it here just to share, share with you. So an IO expander chip, is, it sits on the I2C bus, 
and it'll give you more GPIO signals. And the great thing about if you use this PCF8574 chip, the great thing about this chip is there's no configuring to do whatsoever. You just either write to it and you can see the pins wiggle, or you can read from it and it'll read the pin wiggles. It's as simple as that. And it's, it's a brilliant little chip. And I got it out of that, um, this, this book here. I, I got it out of this book. And uh, I use it quite a bit in my designs. And it means I can then run a data bus across my design of just five, um, five lines. So I've got three for my SPI. And I've got two for my I2C. So I don't need a chip select line running across because what I'm going to do is the chip select is going, to, is going to be decoded from an extra chip on the other side of the board. So yes, it's an extra chip, but if it's the other side of the board, or as we'll see in just a moment on a data cable, I'm not tying up any of these pins. So they're then free to do other functions. So certainly on an Arduino, you're really limited on pins. And so what we can do as well, just going back to this page here, if we use them both together, all those various interrupts and other features, we can put them straight onto the um, like expander bug chip um, and just have like a priority read or a priority write address, which would be in your code. So the the address for this chip here is I've got this set to 040, um, OX40 rather, is the address for this PCF8574, which is in the downloads. So what I would do is I would make sure I write to this chip to switch on any SPI devices that I want. On the other side of the board, I would read if I had to make sure if any, any interrupts on those chips, which I need to do any servicing on. And that little trick as uh, I've called the enhanced serial bus. And um, I've used it effectively. Um, I tend to put it on all my designs these days. And uh, <clears throat> it leads very neatly into John's question about um, how do you run these things off board. So let me show you exactly how you run them off board. <clears throat> right, so um, if you wanted to run any of these data protocols over a cable, well, obviously it does depend on the length of the cable for sure. But generally, this is really for like a ribbon cable. So starting on the left here, if you wanted to send I2C over a ribbon cable, uh, I recommend that you divide it up so that you've got ground, zero volts, then the signal, then the ground, then the signal, then the ground. Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> if you wanted to run I2C, uh, sorry, SPI rather, over a cable, then similar thing, ground, signal, ground, signal, ground, signal, ground, signal, ground, always interleave them. Um, it'll give you much better radio immunity, which um, we mentioned earlier, uh, EMC, and um, it'll, it'll give you much better um, the immunity and, and lower emissions uh, without a doubt. But of course, don't forget, if you're running just SPI over the data bus, uh, over a, a cable rather, each device you have is going to have its own chip select line. So the more devices you want on the end of a ribbon cable, the, the wider that ribbon cable's got to be because you've got to accommodate each device having its own chip select, let alone any interrupts, of course. Whereas <coughs> enhanced serial bus, because there we go, just run there. <laughs> because the chip flex gets encoded onto the I2C bus, we don't, for as many devices as we want, we can still keep, uh, what's that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, probably twelve. You can't really buy an eleven 
uh, way ribbon cable, they don't exist. So you'd probably just have to have an extra ground at the bottom. Now that's all very well for a short cable. What if you want to go a longer cable? Well, there's a way around that as well. And it, it, it's painfully simple once you know how to do it. So I would recommend, if you want to go over a long cable, I2C, is you get yourself an I2C differential driver. And this one works pretty well. Um, so you can probably get that from Farnell, DigiKey, Mauser, all the usual suspects. And you, you just sit on your I2C bus as it would anything else. And it just creates a nice differential drive for your clock and your address data. And it's nothing more complicated than that. And I guarantee you, it will work. Can you just explain that terminology, what a differential drive is? Yes, I will. So a differential drive means um, as one, <clears throat> so with, let's explain here. So if we go back to here, so with the um, clock, for example, We've just got one signal that goes up and down. That's all we've got. So there's not much more to that signal. With a differential signal, what we have as one signal goes up, the other signal usually goes down. So <clears throat> it's, as, it's as simple as, as one goes up, the other one goes down. So the difference between them is what you're looking for. So you, you could have two signals, you could have noise. To say, let's say you had a signal, say, five volts. And you had noise on both of those signals of one volt. But the difference between them doesn't change. So one might go up to, say, five volts plus one volt, and the other one might be minus five plus one volt. So any noise has no effect on the data. And that little trick will enable you to transmit over a quite a long cable. Evidence of this, if you do a bit of digging around and look at RS422 and RS485, those are examples of differential data buses, uh, where they're usually pretty bulletproof. I think those two standards, you can probably run them for a kilometer of cable. So it, it's just a chip. You don't have to do any coding. Just get the chip and just look at the application notes and copy it. And what do you put at the other end? Yes, I that think that's a question. Yeah, at the other end, exactly the same thing. And, and out of it, you'll, you'll get your SDA and your SCL coming out the other end. Is it exactly the same chip? Yes. Or is it, okay. I believe it is. Um, it, yeah, it, check that. Okay. Um, that they'll tell you in the data sheet if it's not. I think it's the same chip, um, but check that in the data sheets. It, it will tell you if, if there is a different one, but I think it might be the same chip. And, and this filter circuit goes at each end. And by short and long cables, what sort of boundary is there between those? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and the well, sort of example I'm thinking of is, say, if I'm doing a smart battery charger, which is about a metre away from the actual batteries, and I want a temperature monitor on each battery, is that going to need a differential driver? I would say, if I'm honest, um, it would probably very much depend on the application. Uh, personally, I would, if I was going over a meter length cable, I would definitely, with, with these sort of, certainly with I2C, I, I would definitely be um, applying a differential data bus to it. Uh, if, if I was going, you know, if I was only going like a foot or something quite short, I'll probably just chance my arm and, and, and see if I get away with it, you know, to be honest with you. But, you know, short, short ribbon cables, you know, if it's just a short one, you know, if you had a short ribbon cable, I, I would probably 
go back to this sort of arrangement because it would work and, it, and it's certainly cheaper. Okay, thanks. And it's exactly the same story um, for um, SPI. There are SPI drivers out there, exactly the same uh, scenario. Uh, I think possibly, I think with the SPI, I think you might need to buy, I think there might be a one or two. I think this one, one might change for two for the other end. But in the data sheet, if, if there is a, a sibling that you need, they will absolutely tell you. But otherwise, um, this here, this is a common mode choke. I put these on all my designs. If I'm going off, it, it just helps take any noise out of the, sig of the signal and increases reliability. And as you can see, once again, you know, I've got, I've got my pull down resistor here on, on this clock, just so, just so I don't end up with a floating clock, which could cause a problem. Because I haven't got my chip selector, any chip selector on this bus. I think this one here, they, they have given you the option of, um, you know, 1D and 2D here. So you could send some two chip select signals down here. Whereas I would probably, you know, put, put it on, um, you know, chip select, put them on my I2C bus. <clears throat> and in terms of, just to finish off here, in terms of if you was on a ribbon cable, how would you arrange it? It would be something like, um, if I can draw it over here, I'll do zero volts. Then we've got SCLK, S SLK, oh, SCK rather, uh, the positive, SCK, the negative, then zero volts. Then mozzy plus, mozzy minus, Zero volts. You get any idea? Yep. Zero could you, volts. Could you use cables for to meant for Ethernet for this Cat five and so on? Yeah, you could actually. Uh, let me tell you. Um, uh, I designed uh, a few years ago weighing scales for a company, and. Yep, um, you know, between the, the weight scale and, and, the, and the display, they call it a POS, uh, point of sale. Um, yeah, we had a long cable um, for the display and I sent a differential I2C bus down the cable. Uh, and it was just an Ethernet cable and absolutely bulletproof. So the answer to your question is yes. And of course, it's dirt cheap, isn't it? That cable. Yeah. Yeah. So the only thing I'd say, just just make sure you know, just just you just pair things up correctly, because when you look at the um, configuration of um, Ethernet, you know, the the just where where are the pairs? But that's the only thing to pay attention to. And I think you could use is it RJ fifty? I think you've probably got like eight pairs or something, um, or something like that in RJ50. And yeah, certainly for certainly to send the entire serial bus, you just need five pairs, which you can get in a cable off the shelf, job done. Right, you're never gonna believe it, but that's all I've got for you. <laughs> so um, questions, comments, Anything you want to share, you'd like me to go over again, uh, usual routine. I've got, I've got a quick question. Yeah. Do you have any uh, techniques for dealing with a recalcitrant I2C bus? Uh, one that is, uh, you've got a device and every so often, for whatever reason, with the lowest uh, pull-up resistors you can possibly put on it, just decides to hang for some reason. Uh, do you have any yeah. techniques? For uh, actually, that's a really, really good question. And um, yes, I do. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you solve the problem you've done. And I've had this problem with arm chips hanging 
over a differential data cable on I2C. In fact, it was the ST micro, uh, Microelectronics, their M0, uh, long data cable, and EMC, yeah, the thing would hang, even though it's differential. So, yeah, there, there's a good way to deal with it. So let me show you here how, how you solve that problem um, of, of hanging. So if you had a hanging problem, yeah. Okay, this is how you fix it. Right, this is SDA. Okay. So what you want to do is, and make a note of this, Kristen, mm -hmm. one nanofarad there. Okay. Then you want to have a ferrite bead. We'll call it FB for ferrite bead. Yep. Yeah. Then you want to have another capacitor of one nanofarad. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so this is your SDA going that way. And uh, well, it's actually bi directional, isn't it? Right. Okay. Now then, what do you do with these signals? So this is, this is coming in over your long cable. So this is your cable end. And this is your PCB end. Yeah, is that okay so far? Mm -hmm. Right, here's what you do with these two ends here. This end here, you tie to zero volts of your circuit. Yeah? Yeah. This one, you're gonna tie it somewhere else. And I would call it like a dirty ground for want of a better description. So this is gonna call this PCB. And I'll show you in a second, this one we're going to call zero volt dirty. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. So on your electronics, I'm just going to draw a circuit board here. So you've got plus V here and you've got minus, uh, oh, sorry, uh, zero volts there. So far, so good. So this is going to go through probably a common mode choke on your board to whatever your circuit is. C, uh, oh, C, C, T circuit. So this here is your zero volts. Yep. And this one here, that's your PCB. And this one here is your zero volts dirty. And that's how you solve your problem. Hmm. Yep, I guarantee that'll work. I've had this problem myself. So it's like, so what I'll do, this dirty, dirty ground, if you like, usually I'll make that a trace around the edge of the PCB. Don't join it up. It's just a trace around the edge. And so each line will have this Pi filter on it. Yeah, this capacitor, one nanofarad, ferrite bead, one nanofarad. <clears throat> and so any, any nasty noise will end up getting shunted away and then basically back to the back to you know, the power source ground without going through the circuit. And that should solve your problem. I've been there myself. Everyone's going, oh, that's a top tip. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, 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 is an, this is how you solve an e, if you have an EMC problem of I2C or a, any data for that matter, causing you problems at EMC immunity. This is how you fix it. Thank you. If you've got a battery, of course, if, you, if you're running off a battery, then one of the things I, you can, if you want to run off a battery, just um, do it that way. And this here might be in the order of maybe something like a hundred micro Henry's or inductor. Okay. Certainly at least 22 micro Henry's, but a hundred would work extremely well. Yes, so really good question there. And, uh, and that is what I would do to solve it. Any more for any more? 
Yeah, um, in the kind of hobby electronics kind of maker's world, um, there's a lot of um, I squared C breakout boards, which use a couple of different kind of standard connectors, if you like. Um, and they, they have the same wiring layout, um, which doesn't have the, the kind of earths in between and are designed yeah. for connecting things with cables. Yeah. So um, I'm just looking up on a, so it's ground, V plus, SDA, and then SCK. Yeah. Um, and I think they chose that order so that if you connect back to front, then you don't reverse your polarity. Instead, you attach your power to your logic yeah. and lines and vice versa. So it's kind of more robust. Yeah. Um, and the Raspberry Pi itself has pull ups on its I squared C lines already. And most yep. of these breakout boards also have pull ups on in case you're using them with a microcontroller. So you yep. don't have to worry about it. Um, are there issues with um, when you start chaining multiples of these, the fact that you've got pull up resistors on kind of essentially adjacent to each IC on each breakout? Uh, I, problem? Don't, I don't think it would be an enormous problem. Uh, I mean, could usually these resistors are usually in the order of, you know, something It'd like... Be 10K seems to be the standard on the... Yeah, so, you know, so, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're going to put, well, you know, number of devices I generally see, you know, on a busy I2C, you know, I mean, it could be half a dozen, that, that would probably be considered to be quite busy. Yeah. So, you know, you, you might drop down to, you know, 2K2. Um, yeah, we'd probably drop down to a few hundred ohms. Uh, would it really be a problem? I don't think so. Uh, you'll probably see a slight increase in current draw. That's probably the most prevalent thing that you'd likely see, I would have thought. I mean, you can always, you can always desolder them, of course. But uh, do yeah, I do I yeah. think there do I do I think there'd be a problem? No, I don't. Um, <clears throat> you, you mentioned about you know a standard pinout. Uh, that's just what they've chosen, of course, isn't it? That, that yeah, there is it, no it, it, there is no defined pinout standard at all. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's it's used by so there's Grove, there's Quick, and there's Stemmer which yeah. are kind of different names they've given to their choice of connectors, but they've all got the same pin out, so it's easy to make adapters and the like. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, anything else I can think of on I2C? I mean, yeah, really, yep, yeah, sorry. Um, no, you carry on. I'm, no, 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 I'll, I'm just gonna wrap it. <laughs> So uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather take questions and comments, you know, and share thoughts. I've got another question on your diagrams. You've got A0 to A1 pulled down to ground. Is yep. that, that setting the address? Yes, it yeah. is. Let me, in fact, yeah. let me just go back to this for you, just so uh, I can just, we can just look at that again. So uh, let me just reshare yes absolutely right one moment let me just reshare this screen with you hopefully um share there we go so yeah so you're referring to to these three here i hope I yes guess. yeah that's just what i chose for for that that um particular chip um, and if you want to one on there do you take it directly to vc yes you do to Yes, you do. Yeah. No, pull yeah. Up. no, no, there you go. So if I want to do 3v3, so obviously get that there. And then this base address, of course, would, well, would actually be OX42, believe it or not. Yeah. <clears throat> a common so, yeah. design that you see on a lot of the, the hobby boards, um, they'll have um, pull down resistors pulling all the address lines to ground with 10K resistors. And then they'll have a um, solderable jumper yeah. that lets you short it to, to V plus. 
Yeah, exactly. If you're designing your own, though, I would probably just tie them straight straight to one of the supply rails. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No problem at all. Great stuff. Well, it's been a, an interesting one. <laughs> and the one other kind of topic that may be of interest is um, dealing with devices where you have address clashes. There's yes. Some, there's some chips that you can software set the address. But you need yeah. a way of kind of powering them on sequentially so that you can set the address on each one and know which one's set to which, um, which, which can be an interesting challenge. Um, and then there's also um, a multiplexer IC, which itself is a I squared C device, and it lets you switch between eight different channels so that yeah. you can kind of have it's a bit like a chip select where you've got if you've got multiple devices all with a, a fixed hardware address you can have one on each channel and and switch which channel that's, active that's absolutely right and just just to expand upon that as an example um i was involved in designing a medical product um a couple of years ago and it had a a maxim chip for measuring um pulse oximetry you know, sort of things that everyone was buying, you know, to see if they had COVID or not. And, and of course, that, that particular chip, the company wanted to have two, one for each finger, on the I2C bus, but there was, there was no means of setting an address. So the people at Max thought nobody would want more than, more than one on an I2C bus. Of course, they wanted to have two. So the first... The first idea was to try and multiplex. But in fact, and here's another limitation um, that may plague you, John, is, is that we, we discovered that the only way we could make this Maxim chip work was if the Maxim chip had its own dedicated I2C bus. So we ended up, I think, with three I2C buses uh, one for one pulse oximeter sensor, one for another pulse oximeter, pulse oximeter, oximeter, because the way it loaded up the bus was a problem. And uh, yeah, and then the third one was for everything else. So it's, it's not always peaches and cream, uh, you know, when you're trying to wire these things up, but it can take a bit of experimenting. And of course, fortunately, you know, the arm chip we had, I think we had the M4, um that had multiple i2c buses so it, it really was very straightforward to redesign it all to sit um, on its own i2c bus so uh yeah these real world problems do happen for sure so look it's it's 8 30 everybody um what i'll do is let you know that the next uh how to design electronics event it's going to be on Wednesday the 5th of January, uh, same time of 7.30. But what I'm going to try and do um, from next year, from January, is the plan is to run them from Make Space itself in town, in Cambridge. Uh, it will also be streamed as well. So, you know, if, if you are in Bosnia, for example, uh, you can still tune in. That's not a problem. Um, but if you want to turn up, um, you know, with a plate of biscuits, then um, definitely do that. And my plan for the, the next exciting instalment is to talk a little bit about AI and how you can introduce AI onto something as simple as an Arduino Uno board. Um, so something which I've been working quite a lot on. So it will be a little bit of maths, um, but nothing scary because AI is just statistics that's all it is and so uh, we'll have a little look at that and uh fingers crossed everything works when we try and do it live okay uh, i think probably bring us to a close there it's 8 30. uh is there anything else anyone would like to add or share before we all sign off yes the silence and
Just to say thank you again, Stephen, for no, that's that's all thing. Yes, thank you. session. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always fun putting these things together. I always, I always learn something myself um, <laughs> when, when I put these things together. So, all right, let's all go put the kettle on, shall we? And maybe I'll I'll see you all in Cambridge in person in January. Fingers crossed.